Just about one year ago, Russian tanks flooded over the border into Ukraine, intent on reaching the nation's capital in Kyiv and displacing their democratically elected government. But things did not go as planned. By the end of the first month of fighting, Russia had already lost a full quarter of its invasion force, including at least 274 tanks. By September of the same year, the tally of lost Russian tanks eclipsed 1,000. That's more than all the tanks in the British, French, German, and Finnish militaries combined. Is the age of tanks really over, or does Russia just suck at using them? Let's dive into this. I'm Alex Hollings. And this is something different. Welcome to Firepower. Right off the bat, don't worry guys, air power isn't going anywhere. But over the past few months, I've been trying to find a way to expand the content I publish on YouTube. And that's really challenging because not only do I do all the research, the writing, the recording, and the editing for these videos, but I also run a news outlet with 12 writers and five original pieces going out every day. So it's just a real big time crunch every week. So pretty soon we're going to be outsourcing the editing of these videos to another person so I can focus on producing more original content. And that's where firepower comes in. The plan is to produce content that's similar in tone to air power, but with the analysis focused more on land systems than on aircraft. And obviously that's not as in keeping with my area of expertise, but lucky for me, Sandbox News has got a bunch of incredible journalists who've been covering land systems all along, folks that I can speak to directly and whose research and work I can rely on when drawing my conclusions for this series. Now, Firepower won't be weekly just yet, but I wanted to give you a sneak preview of the type of content you could expect from this series this week. So let's get into it. For just about a year now, the glaring weakness of Russian armor against handheld anti-tank weapons provided by the West, systems like the American FGM-148 Javelin, has been on full display for the world to see. And many within the defense community and beyond have found themselves wondering out loud, could the era of tanks be over? Spoilers right up front, it's not. But this line of thinking, or this idea, that tanks are hulking metal beasts left over from a bygone era with little practical value on the modern battlefield is nothing new. In fact, it was a pretty common sentiment as far back as the 1920s, which you might note was actually decades before some of the most legendary and pivotal tank battles in all of history would occur. The first tanks used in combat were British, fielded during World War I in an attempt to foil the long and bloody stalemate that had dominated the continent. Thanks to the increased availability of things like internal combustion engines and armor plating, tanks, which derived their name from the cover story for the factories building them, under the guise of water-holding tanks, seemed perfectly suited for withstanding heavy enemy gunfire coming from their trenches. Of course, all new technology comes with problems, and those early tanks proved to be very finicky beasts. In fact, the first time British tanks found a fight, only 25 of the 49 of them actually were able to move when they were ordered to commence their attack. These armored vehicles entered the conflict too late to play a pivotal role in its outcome, and many at the time believed the entire concept of tanks would end right alongside World War I. One British commander famously wrote after the fighting, the tank proper was a freak. The circumstances which called it into existence were exceptional and not likely to recur. Despite British experimentation with a tank force throughout the 20s, the nation that invented these machines went on to disband its armored units entirely by 1928, declaring unequivocally, and I quote, Tanks are no longer a menace, and the decade that followed artillery systems that leveraged shape charges for better penetration through armor emerged, seemingly turning heavy slow-moving tanks into nothing more than expensive targets and proving British suppositions correct. In 1934, Britain's financial secretary to the war office, Duff Cooper, very succinctly explained why tanks were already on the verge of total obsolescence, at least as far as they were concerned. 
I am not in a position to give any information, but it is at least possible that in a few years' time, the most heavily armored car or tank will be as vulnerable to the fire of the future as an old wooden caravan would be to the firing of today. But then, on September 1st of 1939, German forces poured over the border into Poland with more than 2,500 tanks of varying sorts. By leveraging the speed and armor of their tank forces and integrating them into a combined armed strategy, Germany's blitzkrieg tactics allowed them to quickly rout Polish defenses. Germany's early successes in World War II, enabled to no small extent by their Panzer Division, set the stage for the massive tank battles to come in the years ahead. But nonetheless, before the conflict was over, Churchill himself would decide once again that tanks had run their course, declaring quote, we have too much armor, tanks are finished. As British military historian Basil Henry Littlehart wrote back in 1960, time after time during the past 40 years, the highest defense authorities have announced that the tank is dead or dying. Each time it has risen from the grave to which they had consigned it, and they have been caught napping. Of course, tanks aren't the only military technology to get this treatment. Aircraft carriers and heavy payload bombers, for instance, both of which continue to serve as cornerstones of American military might, have shared a similar ebb and flow of public support. Aircraft carriers emerged as among the most dominant warfighting assets a nation could field in World War II. But today, the advent of comparably cheap anti-ship missiles, some with four-digit ranges, have many calling for America's carrier fleet to get the axe. Likewise, bombers, once seen as America's primary form of nuclear deterrence, were largely discounted as old-fashioned once ICBMs started entering service in the late 50s and early 60s. Today, you'll even find folks arguing that fighters should be a thing of the past because improved air defense systems can police airspace more effectively. But like aircraft carriers, bombers, and fighters, tanks not only remain in service, but continue to see substantial investment, both toward sustaining current models and toward developing newer, even more capable iterations. The hard truth, as many military planners see it, is simple. Losing platforms in a fight doesn't mean they're useless. That's just what happens in a fight. Rather than throwing tanks, aircraft carriers, bombers, and fighters away because new battlefield technologies have rounded off their pointiest edges, success in modern warfare is about finding new ways to leverage existing systems and using combined armed tactics to mitigate weaknesses and offset disadvantages presented by different platforms. The truth is, how military equipment and personnel work together in an overarching strategy tends to have a greater impact on combat efficacy than the capabilities of individual systems alone. For their part, tanks have gone from slow lumbering beasts designed to absorb small arms fire and close quarters combat to technologically advanced, fast-moving, and maneuverable command centers, jam-packed with high explosive hate that can be leveraged to great effect when coupled with a sound military doctrine and a winning strategy. And that is the real lesson we can glean from the performance of Russian tanks in Ukraine over the past year. The simple truth is, Russia's leveraged its tank force very poorly, and Ukrainians armed with modern technologies like drones and low-cost missiles have punished them dearly for it. In an excellent piece penned for War on the Rocks called The Tank is Not Obsolete and Other Observations About the Future of Combat, former Marine Infantry Officer and Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Research Institute's Eurasia program, Rob Lee, explains in excellent detail how Russia's heavy tank losses in Ukraine don't accurately reflect the value these systems can have in combat. Instead, Lee posits, Russia's heavy losses actually reflect what I would describe as criminal negligence of the Russian leadership. As Lee explains it, the poor performance of Russian tanks in Ukraine can largely be attributed to three key issues, though I see two of them as sort of different arms of the same problem. The first is a lack of warning and preparation within the Russian chain of command. The second is a poor strategy that exacerbated Russia's existing logistical problems, and I really see both of those as just a shining light on how bad Russian logistics has been. The third is insufficient infantry support to protect those tanks in the fight, and we'll discuss that a bit more later. But I'll start by quoting Lee here. 
Because they expected little resistance, Russian forces made minimal attempts at executing a coherent combined arms operation, which would have required careful coordination and planning between air, ground, and naval forces. Russian ground units simply drove toward cities, unprepared for a fight. That lack of warning within the Russian ranks and the preparation it would have allowed played a big role in Russia's heavy losses during the first few months of fighting. Many Russian troops we've come to learn since didn't know they were actually going to war until just hours before the invasion began. But more troubling still, it seems apparent that their immediate leaders were just as in the dark as they were. Now, during my time in the Marine Corps, I never worked with tanks, but before and after my years in uniform, I worked in racing, mostly for a company that ran racing schools and a series called Skip Barber Racing. As a parts coordinator, it was my job to make sure our pit crews had all the parts they needed to quickly repair a car and get it back onto the track, no matter what went wrong. It was a huge logistical undertaking, even with permanent locations at racetracks around the country and massive parts trailers dedicated specifically to carrying everything our mechanics might need. But even with all our combined years of experience and tens of millions of dollars worth of spare parts, drivers towing trailers around the nation at our request, and mechanics that could honestly work miracles, every race was a panicked sprint to keep our cars running smoothly. Racing is a brutal sport on your equipment, and the only thing I can think of that would be even more brutal on your equipment would be combat. Now, imagine if we didn't put together a plan ahead of time and nobody involved knew we were racing. Imagine if we opted to run the largest race series seen in a half century, and we did it all weeks before any of our parts trucks could arrive at any of the tracks. Then multiply the number of cars we were running by a factor of a few thousand and tell the drivers that they'll probably die if they lose, and you'll start to get a sense of just how poorly organized this Russian invasion really was. Any tanker will tell you operating tanks in a combat environment is a huge logistical undertaking that requires active supply lines and a constant flow of both fuel and spare parts. Russia's massive tank force includes a number of different platforms, including T-72 and T-90 variants that run with diesel engines and T-80 variants powered by gas turbines. This past summer, Russia also began fielding way older T-62s as well, adding to the long list of parts and supplies needed to operate all of these different platforms, even if there's a high degree of commonality among some of them. That lack of adequate warning to Russian tank commanders that we talked about meant that many of these units moved into Ukraine without appropriate spare parts and supplies to begin with. But once fighting began, that problem quickly spiraled into a disaster. That becomes evident when you look at Russian tank losses recorded between February and April, when they were at their absolute worst. By the beginning of April, a whopping 53% of all tanks Russia lost in combat were not destroyed by Javelin missiles or by Bayraktar drones. They were just abandoned after running out of gas. By the beginning of September, Russia had seemingly gotten a grip on some of their logistical headaches, but they really just stemmed the bleeding. Of the 994 Russian tanks lost to that point, recorded by the Oryx blog, 38% of them, more tanks than are owned by many entire nations, had just been abandoned by Russian forces because of logistical or mechanical problems. To make matters even worse, Russian forces, seemingly expecting little resistance, were ordered to advance well beyond the reach of their supply lines. This exacerbated lots of problems, but it's most evident when you look at the higher abandonment loss rates of the gas turbine tanks, which used a different type of fuel than the more common T-72s and T-90s. By September, a full 56% of all T-80 BVMs and 59% of all T-80Us lost by Russian forces were just abandoned because they ran out of gas. What I'm saying here is that more than one out of every three Russian tanks lost in Ukraine were not taken out by enemy fire, but rather by Russia's mind-boggling logistical failures. By now, we've all seen footage of Russian tanks getting wiped off the map by Javelin missiles, popping their turrets like a jack-in-the-box, and demonstrating just how effective infantry troops can be when armed with anti-tank weapons. And while Western and, yes, even Russian tanks have a number of advanced systems meant to protect them from these sorts of attacks, the most effective kind of protection a tank can get against enemy infantry tends not to be more armor, but rather their own infantry instead. 
And this shines a light on yet another glaring Russian strategic failing, this time one that goes all the way up to the force structure level. I'll spare you a summary on how Russian battalion tactical groups are put together, but there's an excellent analysis published by Rusi that I will link to in the description below. Now, in theory, Russia's force structure calls for brigades to be made up of roughly 3,500 troops, but in practice, Russia's brigades are usually staffed somewhere between 70 and 90 percent. With about 30 percent of that force made up of conscripts, that leaves only 1,700 or so well-trained professional warfighters and each 3,500-man brigade. This isn't great, but it just gets worse from there, as Russia has sought to increase the number of battalions they have despite a shrinking pool of enlisted service members, and that made the size of its units from the bottom up continue to shrink. This causes all sorts of problems, but right now we'll focus on the problems it causes for tanks, which are most vulnerable to infantry attacks while fighting in urban environments. I'm going to quote Rob Lee again here. Russia chose to reduce the strength of motorized rifle battalions on BMP infantry fighting vehicles from 460 to 345 servicemen, and many of the battalions that invaded Ukraine were only at two-thirds to three-quarters strength. In practice, this meant that Russian motorized rifle units lacked sufficient dismounts for fighting in urban terrain. Now again, to remind you, tanks are most vulnerable to infantry attack in urban environments. That's where they need infantry support the most. Now, as an air power guy, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention how Russia's rapid advance not only drew their forces beyond the reach of their supply lines, but also beyond the protective umbrella of Russian air power, leaving armored vehicles and their supporting troops vulnerable to attacks from the air, even in the form of very slow-moving and low-cost drones. All this is to say that Russia's tanks aren't really the problem so much as their strategy, their logistics, and their doctrine. The fact of the matter is, tanks aren't going anywhere, even in this era of data-fusing stealth fighters and AI-enabled drones. This time, I'll quote Nicholas Drummond, a former British Army officer and a defense industry analyst, from an interview he did with Vice a while back. Everybody says war in the future is going to be fought only with drones, aircraft, missiles, submarines, satellites, and so on, but none of them can physically seize and hold ground. If anything, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated the immense value legacy systems can still have in the fight, as both Ukrainian and Russian forces have leaned heavily on artillery throughout this conflict. And that use of artillery points to the continued value of armor on the battlefield as mutual support for infantry operations. But in order to keep tanks relevant on the battlefield, they cannot be leveraged as a fighting force unto themselves, and instead, they have to be incorporated into a coherent combined arms strategy that incorporates all elements of the warfighting apparatus. Tanks play their role by engaging other armored assets and protecting infantry as they attack defensive emplacements. Infantry plays its part by securing objectives and protecting the tanks from enemy infantry. Kinetic and electronic air defense systems play their part by intercepting inbound ballistic or cruise missiles, as well as drones. And conventional air power polices the airspace high above for inbound fighters, bombers, or attack aircraft, while other attack aircraft can support infantry and tank operations. Despite our habit of discussing these disparate elements of warfare in a vacuum, their real efficacy can only be found in combining them in an overlapping structure that creates a sum that's greater than its parts. If you can do that, then the tank will continue to play a pivotal role in combat ops for years to come. In fact, with hundreds of European and American tanks now headed for Ukraine in the next few months, we may just see Ukraine put on a clinic in how to leverage tanks on the modern battlefield effectively. And if that proves to be the case, concerns about the era of tanks being over that surfaced this past year will eventually find themselves right on the shelf alongside all the other times experts were eager to dismiss their value. And on that ends this first ever episode of Firepower. Thanks for coming along with me on this ride, and let me know what you thought about it. Air Power will be back at its regular time next week, and I'm looking forward to getting back into the airplane mix as well. And now here's my outro spiel. I don't know, should I come up with a different one for Firepower? I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. 
If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.